Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Nicholas Shazer, and I'm here with Rabbi Dr. Mark Kinzer. Mark Kinzer is President Emeritus of Messianic Jewish Theological Institute and Rabbi Emeritus of Congregation Zera Avraham in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He earned his PhD from the University of Michigan in the study of Second Temple Judaism, and he's the author of several books, uh, Post-Missionary Messianic Judaism, Israel's Messiah and the People of God, Searching Her Own Mystery, and his most recent book, which we'll discuss today, Jerusalem Crucified, Jerusalem Risen, The Resurrected Messiah, The Jewish People, and The Land of Promise. Rabbi Kinzer is also one of the founders of the Society for Post-Supersessionist Theology. Um, that's a good, nice academic term, post-supersessionist, and we'll get into that as we go along. Mark, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, it's a pleasure. Great. Um, so as, as we begin, I, I think a lot of our viewers would be just interested uh, to un understand a little bit about your background. Um, you're a Messianic Jew, uh, which means you're a, a Jew who's a follower of Jesus or Yeshua. Um, maybe just a little bit of a brief background of, of how you came to follow Yeshua, uh, what your background was before in, in conservative Judaism. Um, just a little bit of background and then we'll get started. Okay. Yes. Well, I... Uh... Grew up in uh, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, my uh, my parents were conservative Jews. My father was actually president of our local synagogue. Uh, but um, I and my two older brothers grew up um, without any uh, great attachment to uh, to Judaism uh, or any great sense of identification with uh, the Jewish people. And uh, I came to faith in, uh, in Yeshua, in Jesus, when I was 19 years old. This was uh, many years ago, back in uh, 1971. And uh, it, it was a variety of different circumstances that would really take up our whole time if I were <laughs> to tell sure. that story. Um, I think what's most significant, though, uh, here is simply that my my first teacher in, or I really you could call him a mentor uh, in my faith in, in Yeshua was himself uh, a Jewish man from an Orthodox Jewish background and someone who had a, a, a very strong commitment to the Jewish people and the Jewish tradition. And so uh, within just a few weeks of uh, my new, uh, my my new grasp of the reality of God. Um, he had spoken to me and told me, uh, you know, you you remain a Jew. In fact, you should be a much better Jew than you were before. You should go back to synagogue with your father. Uh, if you get married, marry a Jewish girl, mm -hmm. and uh, don't become part of a church because if you become part of a church, you will lose your Jewish identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I took very seriously what he was saying to me. These were just the, the earliest years of the Messianic Jewish movement. The, 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 the things he was telling me were really quite radical at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so uh, I went back to synagogue and what I discovered was the, the, the Judaism, which had seemed so so dry and lifeless and empty to me before, suddenly took on this uh, this new depth. And uh, I just, I saw that bef before what was empty was empty because I was bringing an emptiness with me uh, into it. I had no sense of the reality of God. Sure. And so uh, the uh, Jewish worship was lifeless to me. Uh, mm -hmm. When I brought that sense of the reality of God with me into the synagogue, suddenly I was able to to see how rich and powerful the, the Jewish liturgy was. And mm -hmm. so in a paradoxical way, for me, my experience was uh, that my my faith in Jesus, my really my coming to know him uh, as the Messiah was really my doorway uh, into really finding my own Jewish identity. Uh, and uh, that, that, that's, that 
I, I say that in really concrete terms, not in a in a in simply a kind of um, oh figurative sense that somehow I felt more Jewish. Right. The reality was I was not living uh, a Jewish life uh, of the sort that my father was living, um, and as a result of my coming to know Yeshua, I started to really live a Jewish life. Wow, that's great. Yeah, um, and that just makes a lot of sense to me. I'm I'm not Jewish myself, but I I grew up Catholic, and after college, um, really got deeply interested in in the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, what Christians would call the Old Testament. I uh, studied Hebrew before go. I was living in England at the time. Studied Hebrew on my own, learned Hebrew, and then only a few years after that, came back to the states to do graduate work, and ended up with AJ, as you know, at at Vanderbilt. Um, and uh, I, I just, you know, uh, Jesus is so inextricably bound up with Jewishness and Judaism for me um, that when I started going to synagogue myself with my Jewish friends in Nashville and elsewhere, I felt as a Gentile extremely at home in, yes. in the synagogue service because, because I was so soaked already in, in Tanakh and Hebrew and, and Jesus as a Jewish Messiah or the Jewish Messiah. So that resonates really well. Um, okay, so let, let's get to your book, uh, but there's just a couple introductory definitions that I'd like you to offer. Um, we, we heard that you are one of the founders of the Society for Post-Supersessionist Theology. Now, I don't think you use the, the word supersessionism no. in your book. No, that's I true. Think, yeah, right. I'm sure it's purposeful. Yes, um, it is. <laughs> and, uh, but, but I do think that your approach to Luke and Acts, that it's sort of kind of hanging in the ether, the, the idea of supersessionism. So maybe if you could offer a quick definition of that for our viewers. Yes. yes. Well, um, supersessionism uh, is uh, often equated with uh, something, another term for it that people sometimes use is uh, replacement theology. Um, uh, this notion that the, um, the church uh, replaces the people of Israel in the, uh, the divine economy in God's uh, salvific purposes. Um, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, th this doesn't necessarily mean that um, Christians who hold a supersessionist approach, um, it doesn't mean that they no longer in any way distinguish the Jewish people or think that the Jewish people have any special role to play. Uh, sometimes Christians um, uh, will uh, will reserve a kind of place for the Jewish people at the end uh, or in the world to come or at the end of the age. But uh, the reality is that when they're thinking about the God's fundamental purposes and work within the world and this this priestly prophetic uh, kingly role that Israel has in the in the biblical story, they mm -hmm. see that fundamental role within the world being occupied by the church, and they don't see it being occupied by almost in any way, really, shape or form, by uh, by the Jewish people. Uh, and right. so, uh, post supersessionist forms of theology um, are those that are attempting to understand the good news of of Jesus, of Yeshua, the message of the New Testament, in a way that uh, preserves this uh, ongoing uh, priestly prophetic role of the Jewish people in history, um, mm. alongside uh, the uh, the ecclesia, the church, the body of of uh, Yeshua, the Messiah, um, and uh, so. You know, there are many different forms of supersessionist theology, many right. different forms of post-supersessionist theology, um, but I think that um, gives uh, enough of a, of a sense of the distinction yeah. between them. Absolutely, yep. Yeah. And, and your, um, your book certainly, it's clear that you're arguing against that, that supersessionist idea very strongly. Um, yes. You mentioned the ecclesia, which was another word I was going to get you to define. Yes. Um, and you, you, you first said church and then said ecclesia. Yeah. I'm glad that you made that distinction because that's the term that you use in your book as opposed to church. Yeah, yep. exactly. And Good. 
the reason I do that um, is very similar to the reason why Messianic Jews do not want to be called Christians. Right. Uh, we Messianic Jews um, want to be called Messianic Jews rather than Christians, not because we think the term Christian is a bad word, sure, uh, but because the connotations of that term at this time um, are such that the term Christian is understood as being mutually exclusive with the term Jew. That's right. Uh, in the in, and since we as messianic jews understand our own jewish identity as fundamental to who we are we uh, do not want any confusion to be uh, uh, brought in uh, to a conversation um, through our, our our identifying ourselves as quote unquote um christians as though we were thereby distinguishing ourselves from sure. uh, from the rest of the Jewish people, and the same uh, the same thing is true really with this term um, church. The term church is of course mutually exclusive in people's minds with the term synagogue. The right. term church is a gathering of Christians. That's right. Uh, and uh, the term synagogue is a worship gathering of Jews. Mm. Uh, and uh, because that's the the way the term churches is understood, that can't really work for us as Messianic Jews, where we gather in the worship of God through Yeshua the Messiah and the Holy Spirit, but we do that as Jews who are worshiping in traditional Jewish forms and understand ourselves to be another type of synagogue. Mm -hmm. um, and again, theref therefore, the term church um, f for us can only work as a designation for a body of Christians, i.e. of right. those with, who are part of the, the Gentile tradition of the worship uh, of God in, in the Messiah. And mm -hmm. so what, um, what, I, what I seek to do in, in, uh, in my writings, and, and there are other uh, scholarly authors who do the same thing, mm -hmm. is to simply use the Greek term uh, ecclesia, which is often translated church, um, right. but which go actually goes back, uh, you know, to the Jewish translation, the Greek Jewish Greek translation um, of uh, of the the Hebrew Bible, uh, and is simply another term that gets used for for the kahal, the gathering of right. people, uh, people of Israel, and so it's. Uh, in some ways, the, the main advantage of the term is its unfamiliarity and the fact that it doesn't immediately yeah. connote a right. gathering of non-Jews. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Just a couple quick points just to um, just for the sake of, of our viewership. Um, uh, Mark noted the idea between, between church and synagogue. Uh, ekklesia, on the one hand, is the Greek term, and synagoge being synagogue in, in Greek. Really, synagogue itself is also an assembly like like uh, almost a, a different word for ecclesia insofar as it's a gathering together so it's not exactly. you're not and, attempting yeah go ahead and in fact that very word gets used in the letter of james apparently mm. as as like a synonym for ecclesia yeah. that's right yeah very good yeah that's important to note and also just quickly note on the on the on the not wanting to be called christian um that's not merely a modern response to Jewish Christian relations and the history of it. And we can see in the New Testament that the term Christian only appears three times uh, for the original Jewish believers in Jesus. And it's always, a, it's never a self designation, right? It's mm -hmm. always somebody on the outside telling them that they're called Christians, right? Yeah. But, but the Jews who follow Jesus don't use this term for themselves. No, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, right. So there's good biblical basis for, for your choice of, of term. I'm going to ask you to do one more, and that's Oyan Galeon. You talk about yes. the prophetic Oyan Galeon. Could yes, you define yes, yes. that for us? Yes, I will. And I think that um, now that's the term I use within the book, which of course um, it's uh, simply the Greek term for the for gospel or for good news. Uh, and um, in this conversation, uh, because I'm dealing with a, uh, I, I presumably a um, a Jewish literate audience or an audience that's interested very specifically in Jewish things. Uh, yeah. Perhaps we could even um, uh, use 
the Hebrew term uh, besora, mm -hmm. uh, as uh, you know, which which again means news or the uh, or the 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 good news. Um, yep. And I use the term evangelion in place again of the term gospel or good news. Um, for for similar reasons uh, to uh, this term ecclesia, I'm in some ways trying to defamiliarize um, the terminology. Um, we have a, a term like gospel, uh, and immediately what it brings to people's minds is um, this message about um, Jesus, the Son of God, who comes um, and uh, dies in our place is raised from the dead that we might have eternal life and mm. live with God forever. Sure. Uh, I mean, it, it, that's a very kind of a, a rather elementary and simple form <laughs> of what people uh, think when they, for, for at least what Protestants think, Catholics might have a slightly um, yeah. uh, more um, uh, refined understanding uh, in relationship to the teaching of the church. Mm. But the, uh, the key thing is that, uh, of course, none of these understandings of the basic message of the good news of the death and the resurrection of uh, of Jesus have anything in particular to do with the Jewish people mm. or the land of Israel. Uh, sure. And the, I think, new or somewhat radical thing I'm trying to do within this book is to argue that the message of the death and the resurrection of Jesus has within it a a prophetic content that doesn't simply uh, affirm the spiritual power of what God has already done in the death and the resurrection of the Messiah, but that um, empowers and points forward prophetically to what God will be doing in the life of the Jewish people in history and uh, and at the end of history or fulfillment of history. Uh, and. Uh, and again, since this is so different than what people normally think of by gospel, um, yeah. what I uh, decided to do was simply use the Greek word uh, iangelion uh, and um, in place of the term uh, gospel. So just as I use ecclesia, I use that yeah. term iangelion. Uh, again, often in the Messianic Jewish world, we just use this term bisola, this, this yep. notion of the, the good right. news uh, that is this term that goes, of course, back to Isaiah, uh, prophet yeah. Isaiah, in which it is a message to Zion, That's to right. Jerusalem, ab yeah. uh, uh, about its uh, God's message of restoration uh, of uh, and and healing and renewal of, uh, of Zion. Sure, right. Or as uh, N.T. Wright would put it, whom we'll get to in a second, the return of of the Lord to Zion, right? Exactly. 